Stitchy Tube. Settle down and watch Stitchy Tube. You know, I remember when I was a kid back in the 70s, like 19, this would have been 1975, 76, 77, somewhere in there. We used to get together sometimes during the day and we'd get to watch a show on PBS, which was so exciting. And there was this song or this show called, I want to say it was like Magic, Magic Treehouse. And it had like a lady in, the, in a treehouse and she would read stories. And we would all get together and we would be so excited because we were watching TV at school. And that was back before like there was a cartoon network and there were shows on 100% of the time. And that she would, she would say like, you know, okay, everybody get ready. We're going to start. Are you sitting tall? And we'd all like sit super tall. I, I don't know. Maybe I think that's what I'm going for when I sing Stitchy Tube. It's like, let's get together. Are you ready? Settle down. We're going to sit, sit here and do some Stitchy Tube stuff. Hello, everybody. It is Stitchy Tube number 32. Lucky number 32. It seems like just yesterday it was 31, but it was last week. I found a bunch of my questions from last time that I had lost. I am an artistic person. And sometimes when you're, maybe even if you're not, I'm a little scattered sometimes. So I had questions here, there, and everywhere. And I've been tidying and getting things organized. And so I came across questions. So some of these you may have asked a while back. I always do answer questions in the video itself. So um, these people haven't waited forever for an answer. I already answered them, but I like to answer them on on screen because I feel like some of these are questions that you might have too. Cheryl S. asked, what is a popular fabric for stitching over one? And I think a lot of people tend to stitch on like 25 count Lugana or uh, 28 count or 32 count Lugana. Lugana we call an even weave and it's got a lot of cotton in it and it's a stiffer even weave. It's not stiff, it's just stiffer than like a Jobelin, let's say. And so it kind of, you know, will stand up in your hand a little bit, which makes it easy to stitch over one on. And then, you know, we call it an even weave because the, the, I mean, I think this is why people call it an even weave because each strand in the fabric that makes up the fabric is a consistent width. Linen tends to be nubby, you know, like it'll have thick areas and thin areas. And really what even weave means is that there are the same, the count of the threads is the same going side to side as it is up and down. So if it's a 32 count, the threads are 32 count this way and 32 count this way. You can have uneven weave fabrics, which means it might be 32 count side to side and 37 count up and down. But we stitchers often call even weave these, these the idea of these fabrics that have even, you know, even Steven fibers running side to side. So the reason that a lot of people like to use Lugana or fabrics like that for over one stitching is that all of their little stitches are going to be super close to the same size. If you stitch over one on like a 32 count linen or a 36 count linen or whatever, you're going to have thin areas and then thicker areas. I, I love that. I love stitching over one where some of the stitches are smaller and some are bigger. Um, there are a lot of people that they really want the, the stitching to look very even. I got to see Ginger Gerald's um, Henry VIII that he's working on, and I believe he's working on an even weave, and those stitches are perfect. He is a very good stitcher, and they just look, I mean, it's just amazing. But I like, you know, for something like that, I guess I might choose an even weave, but I like stitching over one on, on uneven things. But typically, I think a lot of people do use the Lugana, and um, a lot of people will stitch with a full cross stitch, but you, if you get small enough, you, and, or you do enough strands, you could just stitch a tent stitch, which is essentially the first half of a cross stitch. Isabelle's Moments with Crafts asked, what is the difference between French and colonial knots? In my world, the difference is I do one of them and I never try the other one. <laughs> I don't, I can't stitch a French knot. I've tried, I've watched videos. I can't make it happen. I think if I stuck at it, I probably could. But colonial knots to me are so much easier. I have a tutorial for the candle chicking piece that I did about, oh, quite a while back. If you look in my videos, you'll see that video and I show how to, to do a colonial knot. There are other videos on YouTube about how to do colonial knots and how to do French knots. And it's really just, it's, it's a process thing. They're, they end up looking similar, which is just like a little knot that appears on the front of your fabric. To me, a colonial knot 
looks a little more like a little flower. It kind of has, I don't know, like little petals almost to it. But I mean, not petals, it's a knot, but it, I don't know, it looks more. And a, a French knot looks like, looks like a little knot too. It's just a different way to construct it. Glenn H um, asked about my stitching lamp. And I, it's one of the most common questions I get. I have answered it, I think, on a few videos, but I'm gonna tell you again. It's a Viralux Smart Light LED lamp. Um, you can get it in white or black. It's on Amazon. It Right now it's $69.95, and if you have a Prime account, the shipping is free. I have really enjoyed it. It works great. You can dim it down, you can brighten it up, you can make it warmer or cooler. And it doesn't feel like it gets real hot underneath it. Sometimes, um, you know, when you're under a lamp, it's like you just feel like it's the sun beating down on you. It's it's a great little lamp. I've en I've enjoyed it. I've, I've been much happier with this than I was with my Ot Light, which I had for years and years, which finally just pooped out. Um, Lisa H. wanted to know, how do you keep track of thread colors in a palette? I've gotten so that I use palettes more frequently. I had collected a bunch, but I just never used them, and then I just kind of started using them. And this is an example of one of my thread palettes with some threads on it for a sampler I'm working on. And um, this one, I just kind of know which colors are which because there aren't that many colors in the sampler. So it's good for, I think it's good for, for pieces you're working on that wouldn't have a lot of threads. If you had something that had like 87 colors of thread, a palette is not probably for you. Thread drops or floss, you know, floss away bags, that kind of thing might be a little bit better. Or even just working off of your um, bobbins. I have one, I couldn't find which one it was, but I've taken a little tiny piece of masking tape because it'll peel up real nicely without leaving any residue and just write the symbol on next to it. And so you can do that too with a big thread palette like this. I don't sell this palette, I used to. I don't even remember who um, used to carry these. I, the palettes I have now are kind of decorative um, by the Primitive Hair. I don't have one right by me, but they, they're, um, they're real cute, but you could you could for sure do the little piece of masking tape by it too. But it's just you know if you have a if you have a five or six color piece that you're doing for Christmas, they're kind of nice to use. I don't know why they just are. Uh, Darla B wanted to know: Do the cats know their names? Yes, they do, and I can call them by name, and and they will you know if I'm looking for one of them, I can you know stand in a room and call, and that one will come around the corner. So they they do know their names. Uh, and Isab let's see, Isabella's Moments again wanted to know, do, do your cats attack your floss? Rarely. You have to be so careful with floss. If you're a needle worker or a knitter or a sewer, seamstress, sewstress, you have to be careful because cats will sometimes eat thread, like swallow it down, and it can end up gumming up their inside. So you have to be super careful. Ruby, that one, uh, will sometimes chew on thread briar does it sometimes and then they will they want to eat it once in a while like maybe twice a year i'll come upon ruby or briar trying to eat some thread um zero if i'm if i'm making kits i pretty much have to lock him in a room because he just this action of pulling the threads like this he does this <laughs> and he wants to like try to get all tangled up in it but otherwise they pretty much leave him alone i think they you know, it's happened so often around here. They just, it loses its luster. Okay, I think that was everything. One of the questions I had too from last time from my Stitch With Me video is I talked about some Thanksgiving recipes. And after I'm done filming this and while this video is loading, I'm going to put those recipes up on my blog. So I'll have a link below that you can go to my blog and um, look at my recipes for cranberry bread, pumpkin muffins, and uh, my homemade stuffing. And okay, so I think that's that's it. So UFOs, FFOs, I didn't really get a lot of stitching done this week. I had a ton of orders come in, 13 hours on um, Monday packing orders. And I have fibromyalgia, just saying. I'm still learning my limitations. 13 hours was too many hours. And so really Tuesday and Wednesday, I was out of commission. Like I was, I hurt. It's weird because, um, I told Steve it's kind of like walking with like like weights. Like it was so much effort even to move, um, and just real achy and super tired. It was not good, but I'm back. And so I didn't work as many hours yesterday. I really just have to cut down on how many I do in a row like that. 
Um, so I didn't get a lot of stitching done this week because I packed orders all day Monday. Tuesday and Wednesday I did just kind of a bare minimum. And then yesterday it was like working again. Graham came over and helped me pack orders. I learned something cute about Graham. He's my 21-year-old uh, son and he, he lives in an apartment with his friends, but he comes over like maybe once a week to help me pack orders. And he took care of my orders for me while I was away. And I, I was telling him, I said, oh, it's really cute. Sometimes I get emails from customers that they're like, oh, thank you so much for sending, you know, such and such skein of anchor thread. How did you know blue is my favorite? You know, or I, you know, I love this brown. It's amazing. And Graham said, do you try to match, you know, the color up with the person? I said, no, I really just grab in the, I have a um, glass, like fish tank, an old, like antique fish tank that I keep it in. I said, I just really grab whatever's on top. And he said, I try to match it up with their order. So if I see that they're ordering a lot of a certain color, I'll try to give them that color. I think that's very, very sweet. Okay, so I didn't get much stitching done, but I did last Saturday. So after my last video, last Saturday, I took a quilting class with Jennifer at the Fabric Dock in Wiggins, Mississippi, which is near here. And um, I've never taken a quilting class before. It, one of my goals the last year and, and going forward is to just get to know my, my sewing machine a little bit better. I have a nice sewing machine. I pretty much just use it to make smalls. And I know that it can do so much more than that. So I took a class with Jen and we, it was an Alberta quilting class is what they called it. And it was to use this new tool that you, you can actually slide your, um, your rotary blade up through grooves in it to make really, really straight pieces. And so I, uh, one of the requirements for the class was to have a layer cake, which is basically just a, a stack of 10 by 10 squares of patterns and then a solid color. And I was going to just work out of my stash of fabric. And I did because I found that I had a layer cake that's like 10, it was 10, like 10 years old in the bottom of my drawer. And I think I found a really good deal on it. It was a fig tree. I think fig tree is what it's called. And so I was like, sweet, I have one, I don't have to buy it. And I had a bunch of fabric left over from a kit that I made up. So um, I'm gonna show you a few of my squares. They're not perfect because this is my first class, but like this is, so I'm not doing the pattern that they, that they wanted you to do. <laughs> of course, I'm changing it. I'm making them into kind of Quaker style stars. And the fabrics, I don't want them pointing in the same direction. I'm not trying to fussy cut anything because I like wabi-sabi. So I've got that, that's one. And then if I make mistakes, which I've done a couple of times already, I leave them in because I like that. And so like, this is another one. I've assembled that bottom square in the wrong direction, but I love it. That's like, to me, perfect. Um, this, this is another one where I, I put the, the two corners in the wrong order. The green should have been on the outside. I love it. And I'm not doing it with every square. Some of the squares are, most of the squares are gonna be straight on. But a lot of them, not a lot of them, some of them are going to be just whatever they are. If I make mistakes, if it, I mean, if it's a horrible mistake and it's not going to end up square or whatever, I'll, I'll redo it. But like I said, I've said before, I like stitching forward, not backwards. So I went to Wiggins and I took a class on how to make project bags. And it was really fun. I met some really nice ladies there. And the shop, of course, is really cute. I was going to um, film, but I just was having too much fun. I'll film some other time to show you what that's like. Here's the project bag that I made. And I made it at the class. I think it turned out pretty cute. They picked out the fabrics, and it was all pre-cut for us. Now, the cool thing about this is um, it's filled with this product, Bozal Innerform Unique Fusible Foam Stabilizer. So um, you actually can iron the fabric on the back and on the front was just ironed to that foam and it just sticks down and then you can put some lines in it to keep it from, you know, bubbling or puckering or coming loose. And I just did mine freehand. Next time I'll use something to draw lines. But um, Jennifer was kind of excited about me taking this class because she wanted to hear how they did the binding. And actually they taught me a really easy way to do the binding. When, when the woman who was teaching the class announced that um, we were going to have to bind the edges, all these other, I don't quilt, so I was like, I don't, I don't know. But they were all like, oh, binding. <laughs> but it was just a, it wasn't on the bias binding. It was straight. And she already had it cut, but it really wasn't so bad. And I did mine by machine. She showed me how to do it by machine. I could do it by hand too, but machine was quicker. And I just, you know, it was just a class. But it was really fun. I'm, I had to call the place where I bought my machine 
like six or seven years ago. I, at some point, probably five years ago, threw away, just I was cleaning the garage, threw away the box that my sewing machine came in. And I believe that inside the box was the kit that came with the sewing machine. So it was like my zipper foot and a lot of the little tools and whatnots that go with your machine. So I contacted them this week to see about getting a replacement set. And um, so I didn't have, I don't have a zipper foot right now. So I just had to sew a little, little bit away. But this was actually a pretty easy project. I want to try making a few more this weekend just so I don't forget how to do some of the th parts that she showed us how to do. So I made that and it's got the, it's got the vinyl on the front so you can see your project inside. It was fun and I like the fabrics that she, she chose. They're really cool. And I like that this will stand up. So like if you have a project in it, you could put them in a basket and flip through them and they're not going to get droopy. Okay, so, oh, and then I was gonna show you, I have a, I don't think I've shown this. This is one of my reproductions and this is the original. I had it framed recently. I've, I know I've shown you guys the, the reproduction, but this is the original MD sampler and I call this Christmas colors because it's, it's very Christmassy to me. It's a lot of red and some soft greens and it's got like this cute little red dog down here. But I had it, I had it framed earlier this year finally I've had this sampler for years it is available as a chart on my website it's called Christmas colors I don't have it as a download you just would have to buy just the regular pattern this is one that Barb and Alma have tried to buy multiple times every time I have it at market they want to buy it again and I have to remind them they have it I love the strawberry border I don't know what happened to it I don't know if that's burn or I mean it's probably not burn if it's some kind of oh, stain or something but that's just one of those things that I kind of I think makes it, you know, makes it a, an authentic old thing. So since I didn't have any, you know, other needlework to show you this week, I thought I'd show you that one. Okay. That was my, that was my stash flash. Oh, that wasn't my stash flash. That was my UFO FFO. This is, this is my stash flash. I'm about to show you. I didn't, I didn't get any needlework related things this week, um, but I did go to the quilting store. And so I got that foam that sh they sell at the quilting store. I don't know if they sell that like at a Joann's or a Hobby Lobby. You'd have to maybe look and see. Bolsel Inner Form Plus. I'll show it one more time just in case you want to try it. It was, it was super slick, super slick. But while I was there, I got some fabrics. She has a section of um, clearance fabrics. It, the store is just super cute. And she's got an area of like clearance fabrics that are still on the bolt. And then they have a colored sticker on each one. And it tells you like, you know, based on the sticker color, how much that fabric is per yard. And then she has this spinner thing. It's got three spinner parts. And I don't know what it used to be for, but she uses it to hold one yard cuts of fabric. And everything on there is like, you know, $6 a yard, but if you buy five of them, it's $5 a yard. And so I found five um, fabrics that I thought were very cute. This one has got um, carrots on it, which is really cute. $5 for a yard of fabric is pretty, pretty cheap. I love this one. I don't know like the brands or anything with these, but I think that's really, really cute. I got this bright yellow one that's got some navy and cherry, cherry red kind of primary colors. I got this red one that reminds me of um, fireworks or mosaics and then super practical, um, really pretty blue with just polka dots. So those will be good kind of accent fabrics for making project bags or whatever. And then they had out of their regular fabric, well, on, so in their clearance section, they had about seven or eight bolts of a linen cotton blend, which was intriguing to me because I like linen. And there's nothing else in it, no polyester. I got a few colors because that was like $6 a yard or something like that, which is really cheap. It's very, very nice fabric. Now, the ones off the bolt that are on clearance, you have to buy at least a yard. So I got these two, just kind of this, this green and this kind of magenta color. And I got a pretty gray, soft gray. And then I got this cream color. So those are all pretty practical colors. I've been wanting to try one of um, Lori from Not Forgotten Farms, one of her... Um, kind of embroidery stitched things. She's got some really cute Christmas ones on her site that you can download. And um, they had a couple other colors, but these were, those were my favorite four. I thought they were very pretty. And some of, the, then they had a, a bin of like a big, like galvanized tub of eighth yard cuts. And I got these just different 
eighth yard cuts. They were $1.25 each, but if you bought four, you get to pick out one for free. And this one was kind of cool because it's got like um, cross stitches on it and little embroidery stitches. That was, I got the last one of that. I don't know what that was. This is a map, maps of the world or something, which I love. I love um, fabrics that are like maps, calligraphy, ledgers, letters, words, you know, that kind of thing. And that's cute. I got this little strawberry one. But anyway, it was this big galvanized tub and I was like kind of digging through. And, you know, those of us who are bargain shoppers, sometimes you got to look where people haven't looked. And so I, I told one of the gals, I was like, I'm going to dump this out on the table, but I promise I'll put it back. She was like, yeah, absolutely. Go ahead. So I dumped all of it out and dug through it. And those are my favorite ones. This was in just a, a quarter yard bin. It's, I think it's really cute. Very old fashioned. Her fabrics choices are so cute. She's got a lot of like real vintage, you know, kind of thirties and forties. And then she had some, um, Sandy Gervais, a lot of the French general fabrics. Um, she doesn't carry any Blackbird designs. She said there's just so many fabrics to choose from these days. Now, the person who taught the class was made a project bag using this. And she said this was a fabric that was available and then it wasn't. And now it is available again. And it's uh, like old advertisement. I See, I love that. I'll be that lady. <laughs> I, so I like that. And it's kind of a, you know, just charcoal and kind of gray. I think that's so cute. And then this gal is on Etsy. And you can actually buy her original artworks. I'm trying to remember what. I'll put a link below if I can find her. But it's just, look at how cute. This was just on the bolt. On the bolt. <laughs> There's my Midwest coming through again. Her stuff is really, really cute. I don't know what I'm going to use that for. It would make a really cute project bag to figure out, like, you know, like how a, a square of that. Like, if you if you squared it off with these top three and the bottom three, that would be super cute. But her things are really cute also. So that's what I got at the quilt store. Most of that was on sale, and some of it wasn't. Okay, so that was my stash flash. Last time I had a giveaway for a chart called Sampler Folk. And you might remember I bought this on eBay only to discover that I have this chart already. So I'm giving away my second one. This one goes out to uh, Mississippi Stitcher Jody Segrist. Mississippi Stitcher Jody Segrist. And you win. And so um, email me below. My email address will be down below and with your address and I'll send you this in the mail. Uh, the question last time was, what are you... Uh, what are you working on for Christmas? And a lot of you have projects. Now, I, don't, I didn't write down what, what Jody's doing. Shoot. But everybody's got, a lot of people got have things going on. Some people are just like, you know what? I don't do Christmas gifts. I'm just doing my regular stitching. But a lot of people had things in the works, which is great. The next drawing is going to be for um, these six sampler threads. <laughs> I thought they were kind of pretty prim colors. I got uh, Fisherman's Wharf, Cast Iron Skillet, Grasshopper, Pumpkin Pie, Apple Cider, and Straw Bonnet. And so that's the prize for this next time. And the question is, ouch. Okay, so at Thanksgiving, because some people talked about that this week. So at Thanksgiving, which dish is it that you look forward to the most? I, I have asked people in the past, just, you know, friends and family or whatever, like, what to you is the quintessential part of the Thanksgiving meal? And, you know, I mean, I think most people would say the turkey. Like, if you, if you don't do the turkey what's the point but so turkey or not what's your favorite what's what's the dish that you're like oh yeah this is the one I really look forward to I love the homemade stuffing that I make I would have to say that's probably my favorite part this year I'm thinking about changing up my apple pie recipe I usually make apple pie and pumpkin pie and I saw on my news feed my news feed I think this week that Gordon Ramsay has a different way to make apple pie that's supposed to be really good. And he makes more of a, the crust is slightly different. And then he actually like kind of cooks the apples first and kind of um, brings the sugars out. And, you know, like he does them on the stove top, maybe in butter or something. I didn't read the recipe. It didn't seem like it was gonna be really hard. It's just he kind of changed it up a little bit and it looked really, really good. So I might see, if there's a video on how to do that, but that sounded really good. 
Uh, my son, Graham, he said he and his friends are thinking about doing Friendsgiving this weekend. And if so, then Graham said he's going to make the green bean casserole. And he said that's about his favorite part. It's so funny that, you know, Thanksgiving, the Thanksgiving meal, for those of you who aren't, you know, don't celebrate or aren't, you know, in America, it's such a good meal. Why the heck do we make it only once a year? It's crazy. It's like the perfect meal. It's, to me, none of it is hard. It's not rocket science to put a turkey in the oven. It's not. Um, but it's so delicious. I like to get the honeysuckle turkeys. And they're, we can, I could get them at Walmart. They were like 68 cents a pound this week, which is so cheap. And I just find that it's a very juicy, flavorful bird. Okay, so that was the giveaway. And that's the next drawing. Uh, and I already talked about my recipes. So let's go to page two. Okay. Uh, last time I did a list of 11 just kind of ideas or pointers for people who wanted to maybe start their own cross stitch store. And a lot of y'all were real, um, friendly about it and thought it was great to listen to even if you don't ever have a plan of opening a cross stitch store. Um, some people were like, oh yeah, I, you know, I, that, all that makes sense. But a good number of people asked, you know, emailed or in the comments said, could you do the same thing, but for designers? And so, yes, I can. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give my list of 10 and it's 10 tips for budding designers. So if you're thinking about becoming a designer or even just if you're interested to know like what I would recommend, because um, I do have people ask about this too uh, for advice on, on designing. Uh, and these are not really in any particular order. I realized once I wrote them down that it may not, the order may not make total sense, but the 10, 10 ideas are the same. Number one is to just start creating sketch you know put some stuff on your get get a program and fiddle around with it on your computer um, paint go straight to fabric whatever just start and I think that's what a lot of what people get hung up on is just like the I want to do this I don't know how to do it and they just get stuck just with the, before they can even get started so just start creating the first things that you make will not be good. <laughs> most most likely the first things you make will not be good. My first things were not good. Um, I look back on them and I'm like, Ugh. <laughs> not my favorite. But it's going to take you a while to develop your own style. But you can't develop your own style if you never start. So just start and stitch some of it. Pick out colors because you're only going to learn by doing it. And so get started. If you're thinking, if you're like, oh, I'd like to be a designer, why not try? Just Make something, create something. Um, number two is to get software for creating your charts. A lot of people ask me what software do you use? I use Mac Stitch, which is for the Mac. There really aren't a lot of options for designing on a Mac. I'm I, Mac Stitch is okay. I don't love their choices of symbols, but other than that, it's a really good software. And I wish there was a way for me to to make some of my own symbols. They don't have just like a dot, which is white, right? And I don't think they even have like one that it's just like a minus sign. So there's some very basic symbols. And then they have some really weird ones where it's like an hourglass and some like a tree. And those aren't good symbols. To me, like the alphabet, numbers, and then a lot of those special keys, you know, like the at sign, the, the dollar sign, the percentage sign, these, the greater than or equal to, those are all good. And so when, when the symbols get too heavy and, and uh, detailed, you have to really have the chart be really big in order to make those symbols readable. And it's just not fun to read. But get design software. A lot of them just do a, a Google search. Just Google it. My uncle, uh, Dana, uh, used to, you know, he, he knew kind of knew what the internet was. But he didn't have a computer and he didn't really know how to use a computer. He just knew that there was like this web and he was super interested in like dietary helpful things. So he would want to know, you know, like what's a good food to eat if you want to increase your memory. He, uh, for him, it was always what, what'll help you, your memory. And the funny thing about that was Dana had a memory like a trap. So he knew everybody's birthdays, when they were married, what their kids' names were, wh when their kids were born, where they were born. But he always wanted to know how to increase his memory because he said he felt like his memory wasn't very good, but it was really quite good. But he would call me on the phone sometimes and go, hey, I'm wondering, you know, I'm wondering if you could uh, look up some uh, 
information on foods to help your memory, uh, just web it. Web it. He would use web like a <laughs> web like a verb. Okay, so Google software. PC Stitch is another popular one, but there are. I used to use PC Stitch when I was working on a PC at home, but just try some out. A lot of them will have a free trial where you can download it and create with it. It's just that you won't be able to print anything that you create. Um, they give you that ability once you've paid for the software. So just check out some different software. That used to be, you know, of course, and we probably all have, have designs like this still in our stash that people designed by hand, just on graph paper. I cannot imagine. Like, that's crazy to me. That would, because you, you have no ability to edit. No easy, <laughs> no easy ability to edit. Number three is make a list of ideas. And I kind of keep a notebook with, if I have an idea for something, I'll go jot it down in the notebook because you'll forget. And so just kick around some ideas for things. What are some things maybe that you you would like to stitch or some ideas for themes or color palettes or whatever? Just just start writing stuff down uh, because, and, I, and really I kind of find that once you start writing things down, you're like, oh, I have another idea. Oh, I have another idea. So make lists of those so you don't forget. Uh, number four is to consider the business side of it. To me, the tricky thing about being like artistic and having a business is that a lot of times people with artistic temperaments struggle with the business part of it. So they may struggle keeping organized with, you know, like bills and paperwork and invoices and keeping track of inventory. Um, you know, some of that kind of there's type A brain stuff and type B brain stuff and it's always amazing to me the designers that are like right on top of it and are still super talented. Like to me, Linda Ebright at Lizzie Kate, she just had it together, but she was so artistic, so amazing. And so um, think about the business side of it. How are you planning to sell right away? Because you're not going to get an account with a distributor immediately. You just won't. It's pretty unlikely. Especially if you're just, you haven't really spent any time in the industry and you have no other like published background or anything like that. So what's going to happen at first is you're going to put out a few designs and no one is going to, you know, no one's going to pick them up really right away. And so that's one of the big questions that I get from people is how do you get your charts in shops? You get your charts in shops by, you know, success finding finding designs that people want to buy and so a lot of people a lot of designers now start out on etsy which is fantastic you can sell downloads which means you would have no printing costs or you can sell printed charts too that way you can just kind of sell a little bit and kind of dip your toe in and see how it goes the distributors really will start taking you seriously once you have you know four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve charts once you have like a little you know, so they can see, okay, this person's, you know, obviously creating charts. I think they probably, I don't know this for sure, but they probably get a lot of emails from people who are like, I've designed a pattern. Would you like to carry my designs? And they have one pattern and it's really kind of a starter pattern. So you're, like I said, your first stuff that you make is not going to be your look. So um, think about how you're going to, you know, maybe you, maybe you don't even want to sell them until you've got six or seven designs under your belt but just you have to you have to consider the business side of it um you could get some kind of a website too whether it's on facebook you could post on instagram um, i use wix as my website host there are a lot of companies now that will host your website and kind of help you through building a website but you really just kind of have to start promoting yourself and what i tell people is eventually if you stick at it and you and you know and you work hard and you you'll you'll eventually get a design where everybody notices you. And I can't tell you what that design is because it's it's going to be when you've developed your look and you have a great idea and just every, the universe kind of comes together and then all of a sudden especially with with floss tube now that somebody shows it and then all of a sudden everybody's got to have it. I can't tell you how long it's going to take you to get there. It might be your second or third design. It might not be until your 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th design. Um, but you just have to keep, if you really want to be, you just have to keep putting stuff out there. Uh, number five is develop your own look and try not to copy anybody else. I think one of the things that end up, ends up happening with people is that they say, oh, well, this person's successful and these are the colors they use, or this person's successful and this is what her look is like. 
And there have been people over the years that you see their designs and you're like, mm, that looks like, she, you know, she's pretty much copying this other designer. She had a, she, you know, she had a design just like that with the same saying on it. And this one is just kind of tweaked a little. Don't do that. People know that you're doing that and they don't, those designs don't sell well. So don't, while you can learn things from other people's designs, you know, like see how they put things together or their color palettes or get design ideas. It has to come from you. It has to be you. Copycats don't, they, it just doesn't really sell very well because people want the original. So be original, be, be your own original. Um, okay. Number six is I said, I, and I said this already is don't expect, don't expect to be immediately successful. It just, it doesn't happen that way. Now it's, I'm not saying it couldn't, I'm not saying like I'm trying to remember, uh, was it Blue Ribbon Designs? I think her first design was a book. And she won like a blue ribbon with a sampler maybe that she designed. And people just went crazy over this book. She did really, yeah, I mean, she really kind of had a look almost right away. But most people just don't, you know, it takes them a while. Uh, number seven. After you've got a small catalog of designs, then go ahead and start contacting the distributors. The three big distributors here in the United States right now are Yarn Tree, Hoffman Distributing, and Wichelt Imports. And so contact them with samples of your charts, send them in the mail even, and um, with a price list or whatever, and your contact information, and just see if they're interested in picking you up. When they pick, if when and if they pick you up, that's really nice because that's another venue for you to really get your designs out there because they'll go up on those websites and shops can easily order them. I would say that, you know, you could contact shops directly if like, let's say you've got one that you you know the owner or whatever, but typically getting in with a distributor is a good way to get your charts in, into shops. Printing, you got to think about printing too. Printing is... Printing to me is like one of the trickiest things with being a cross-stitch designer because how many do you print? You know, you see people like Blackbird Designs, their printing is so great. They sell thousands and thousands of their patterns that they create. And so they, um, they do the, you know, full color printing and it's professionally done and everything. And they can say, hey, look, we're going to order. I don't, I don't know how many they order. Let's say it's 5,000. And you get some kind of a discount or, you know, whatever. It just makes it easier to just know that you're printing this many. It's not cheap to full color print if you're small. So to say, you know, like, oh, I want a hundred of these. It's not really probably going to work out that well. I use um, a Xerox. It's a free color printer. It's a very nice printer. The printer's free as long as you buy your ink from Xerox. And you can check them out online. Just Google... Um, well, I'll put a link below to free color printer. Let me. And um, the ink is comes in cartridges, and, and the cartridges can be recycled. Lindy at the Silver Needle told me about this years ago. It used to be that if you got the free color printer, you had to do a minimum number of s copies per month and send them proof. There was a counter that kept track of how many copies you were making. Now it's just that you have to buy your your first order of ink from them. Is the deal. And that's going to set you back like $900 to $1,000. But like I said, the printer is free. The ink, you can get double, kind of double quantity ink where the ink cartridges last an extra long time. And you can make a lot of copies that way. That way you can copy things on demand until you get going. Um, you know, some designers that I've talked to over the years have said, you know, gosh, we have so, you know, thousands and thousands of charts that are kind of old charts that we had printed that we're just really gonna just have to have the shredder come and shred them up because they're, they're not selling anymore and what do we do with them? They're just a fire hazard, honestly. And so to me, it feels kind of wasteful to to like print, go through the effort and expense of printing something like that. And just with the thought that maybe someday it's they're not gonna be useful to you anymore. Um. Okay, number nine is go to market. And I think I said that about new shops last week too. But that's a good way to introduce yourself to stores and um, really get your name out there. Now, I will say once again, don't expect it to go great the first time because nobody knows you. You're not going to have a big catalog. You're not going to have like a big, you know, successful chart that everybody had by that point probably. And so people who are new to market, 
the first market may seem kind of disappointing. Um, but like I said, don't expect to be for people to go gangbusters right away. They have to see you a few times before they're going to catch on to your your designs. But do go to market. You can if you know if you don't have a distributorship at that point, maybe you can pick one up there too. And then the number 10 thing is keep at it and just expand from your successes. So for me, like with Raise the Roof Designs, my first, our, our first big hit was Witchy Washy. And I'll put a picture right there. Let me put a note here, Witchy Washy. And I, just, I had an idea driving, pulling off the interstate one day for this pattern. And I think I designed it in about 45 minutes. I just knew exactly how I wanted it to look. And that was kind of what took off for us. And then because that one was successful, I created a whole line of clotheslines and Sue, Sue had a clothesline too that she did. And so having, like I said, you're gonna find, you're gonna find yourself, but, but your customers are gonna help you do that because they're gonna reward you when you've got it, things just right. So just follow, follow your successes. If you have failures, but you're like, gosh, I think that was such a great idea. Well, try, try some more, try changing it up a little bit, maybe change the colors or the size of the project or the types of stitches included and just really just keep at it. Try not to get discouraged. And I think it's hard for people because, you know, you see designers that, um, you know, it seems like, oh, they're, gosh, they're very successful. Well, they've worked a long, a long time to get there. Nobody gets there right away. And um, nobody's stuff looks like their final look. You know what I mean? If you look back at like Barb and Alma from Blackbird Designs, if you look at their earliest patterns, you can see their style in there, but they're they're just in the process of really just developing what their final style is going to be. Now, they're, now their patterns are instantly recognizable, as is like, you know, look at Brenda Gervais or Bent, Bent Creek, some of those designers. You can go, oh yeah, I know who that is. That's developed over time. So just, you have to just really stick at it. Okay, that's my list of 10. Uh, next is going to be what I'm all into. And I think I'll start with um, what I'm drinking here today. This is uh, Ocean Spray Whole Berry Cranberry Juice. But watered down. It's got, it comes in a carton. I'll put a picture here. It comes in a carton. And it's like apple cider if it was cranberry juice. There are a couple of other juices in it. It's really a thicker, kind of cloudier juice. And this week I was, I poured another glass of it and I was like, gosh, this is just really, you know, very, very flavorful and very thick tasting. And I watered it down and it's awesome. So it's just, you know, like you can drink like half as much of the cranberry juice part of it. It tastes really good. If you like cranberry juice, it has no sweeteners in it, just juice. And so I guess I feel, feel pretty good about that. Uh, I'm all into Bath and Body Works socks. I think I told you a video or two ago that I went to Bath and Body Works and got some candles. Every Christmas they have these socks and I haven't worn mine yet. I think they have six different styles this year and they're infused with shea. See there, it says shea infused lounge socks. The cozies. And I, th I, I know they had a penguin. These to me were my two favorite ones. They are so super soft. Oh, I didn't notice what they said. The day, hibernate the day. I wonder if they, okay. But anyway, they're really, really soft. And am I wearing a pair today? No, I wore a pair last night. Now they're infused with shea. So the first time you wear them is super amazing. And it, it's super, it stays super amazing, but the shea over time just washes out. You just wash them in the washing machine, just like anything else, but they're not terribly expensive. How much are they? Oh, 850. Well, <laughs> they're a nice stocking stuffer. They feel like such a treat. And so if you like soft, squishy socks, Bath & Body Works. They're, they tend to run out. Like at your local Bath & Body Works, these, they sell out and it seems like they don't get a lot more once they're gone. I'm all into Neutrogena Deep Moisture. Uh, it dried out here. It was 20 degrees last night, I think. And last week we were running the air conditioning. But my skin has just gone whoop and like has no moisture. And typically I don't have a problem with that. And I just seem really dry this year. And I have just like a Burt's Bees kind of lotion that comes in a squirt thing. And it's, but it's a very thin lotion with some SPF in it. So I've never really bought a day cream before. They can be very expensive. I was kind of shocked. I went to Walmart and I stood 
you know, in the, in the lotion area. And I was like, oh, I don't, I don't know which one do I do. Some of them are like $45 for, for lotion. Now this has SPF 20 in it, it says with sunscreen. This one was $8, I think. And, you know, I was like, okay, if it's $8, if it's not that good, it's fine. It's great. Um, my skin drank it in and I applied it several times the first day. And you know how like when you're a kid and you, you're playing outside and you get super hot and you just, you're exercising a lot and then you get real thirsty, how you go inside and you get a glass of Kool-Aid or water or whatever and you drink it and you drink it so like you don't take a breath, you just drink it all in and then you go, and then you go, <laughs> like that, like that because you drank it so fast and hard. That's like what my skin was doing. It was like, okay, more of that, please. I need to glug it in. So it's, um, and it's not overly thick. It's kind of a light. And it, ha it doesn't smell like it really has a fragrance. It smells slightly of something, but it's, it's not heavily fragranced. Oh, it says it helps prevent sunburn. Uses directed. Okay, so I like that. Uh, another, be another beauty product, because I'm so into beauty products. My hair can be frustrating because I have thin hairs, but I have plenty of them. So like my hair is not thin, but the hairs are thin. Each hair is very fine. And so it's really hard for me to get a lot of body into my hair. And this week, I don't know, I was kind of feeling frustrated with my hair, I think. So I dug through, I'm trying to like use things up. You know what I mean? And I dug through my, um, I have a drawer that has like my hair curler in it and my straightener that I don't use right now, but I may in the future. But I had this in there and it's Herbal Essences, um, what is it, tussle, tussle Me Softly, Tussling Spray Gel. And I was like, oh, I forgot I had that. And I, you spritz it in before you blow it dry. And I blow my, blow my hair dry like upside down. Like I hang upside down so my, my head is like between my knees and I spray this in and then blow it dry. And it seemed really to help a lot and it's not sticky. So if you have fine hair, give it a try. It's not, it's... It, it's it's a spray gel, but it doesn't feel like a gel. A lot of times I feel like gel can feel real icky. Okay, socks, face cream, herbal essence. Okay, this I got for Christmas a few years ago. Amer the Complete America's Test Kitchen TV Show Cookbook. And it's from 2001 to 2013. I don't know what the current iteration of this is. You would be able to find this on Amazon, I'm sure. So if you don't know, America's Test Kitchen is a show, but they also have a magazine. And kind of what they do is they take recipes and they figure out scientifically what is the best way to make things. And they're all in here. So there's a, there's a chocolate chip cookie recipe in here that is amazing. It makes the best chocolate chip cookies ever. Anytime I want to make something, if I'm feeling adventurous like trying a new recipe, I go and look for that thing and Every time I'm like, this is the best of this that I've ever had. They just know. And they explain before each recipe why it is that their version is so good. Because they'll, they'll be like, you know what? You got to add an extra egg yolk, not a whole extra egg, but just the yolk. So it has more protein. So the cookie has more chew, that kind of a thing. So they explain to you why the recipe works the way it does. It's really a great cookbook. So if you're looking for... You know, it's, it's not heavy on pictures, I would say. You know, there are pictures, black and white and color, but it's not going to be one of those, like, glossy, Pinteresty kind of cookbooks. This has got a kabillion recipes in it, and it's, like, the best way to make everything. And a lot of it is you're not going to have thought of the way that they, they do it because they, they'll add something weird like a teaspoon of vodka or whatever, and it's like, why would you put vodka in pie crust? Well, there's a reason, and they just have got it. So this is a this is a great cookbook. I'm all into it. I'm got bananas that have gone overripe, and I'm gonna make banana bread. Last time I did, I used the recipe in there. Sorry, Grandma's recipe. This one was be <laughs> this one was better. I thought. Okay, so I got that America's Test Kitchen Ocean Spray. I'm all into lately the idea of the benefit of the doubt. There was someone that was driving me a little bit crazy. Uh, a couple weeks ago, and I was like, what is it about this person that makes me a little crazy? And I was like, oh, this person doesn't really give people the benefit of the doubt. This person is kind of hard, does a lot of complaining about other people and the way they do things. My dad continues to say and has always said, everybody's fighting a battle. 
And I think it's true that we all have our, our things that we're good at and things that we're bad at and things that we struggle with. And I think, you know, probably most of us, we're trying our best getting through each day. We're doing the best we can with what we've got. You know, whether it's our financial resources or our physical abilities or our mental abilities, our emotional abilities. And I'm, I don't always give people the benefit of the doubt. I think the people that I struggle the most with giving the benefit of the doubt to is people who don't give people the benefit of the doubt. You know, I don't, I struggle with people who are short-tempered or um, mean-spirited. And I mean, they're probably doing their best too with where they've come from. I guess you just never know. You never know where someone's come from. So I guess it just kind of comes down to not judging other people, I'm not sure. But I guess also give yourself the benefit of the doubt because sometimes it's easy to be hard on, on yourself. Like I'm hard on myself sometimes and like, oh, I didn't do that perfectly or I didn't, you know, I made somebody unhappy or I, I didn't do that the right, the way that I would have wanted to do it or I didn't do it as quickly as I should have. And really, I'm doing the best I can. And I, and I think you guys are probably too. So just give people, including yourself, the benefit of the doubt. That's what I'm, I'm into. I've just been considering it lately as, a, as an idea. I'm also all into, this is my last thing, I'm all into Angela Clayton. I'll put a link to her channel below. She is a b adorable young lady who is a seamstress. And I don't know how old she is. I would guess she's in her early to mid-20s. I haven't really gone back to watch her very first videos. She has many videos and she has like 350,000 subscribers. She makes clothing here on YouTube. Well, she, she films her, her making clothing and she loves to make like period clothing, like from the 1300s on. She's really into clothes from the 1930s, but she makes hats, she makes shoes, um, she'll go shopping like antiquing or, th or thrifting or whatever and show you like what she's found that's really cool. And she just has the coolest sense of style. And she's very, I feel like she's very mature and she's um, very relaxing to listen to. I really like her. I really like her. So um, check her out. If you're looking for something, if you're like, you know what, I need to not watch Floss Tube right now, check out Angela. Uh, she's really she's really quite lovely and her sense of style is amazing. I love watching. She has stash, she has stash videos too where she shows fabrics that she's got like she'll go to the garment district in New York where she she lives near there and she'll show you like all the fabrics that she got and she gets amazing deals on fabrics now she's not buying the kind of fabric that we're buying she's not buying fabric for for project bags or for finishing pin cushions she buys fabric to make these period clothes this this period clothing but it's so fun to see like because she explains why she picked them out and why she thinks the fabric is amazing and she films like her successes and her non-successes. And I just, I think she's really fun to watch. You know what time it is. That's what I'm going to do this week. Okay, I don't have too much left. Um, I wanted to update you on a few things with the website and the business. So if you don't want to hear about that, you can leave now. But I've got some exciting stuff coming up. Uh, Christmas Land is uh, debuting again tomorrow. This is a pattern that uh, a long time ago I, I used to sell to Sharon Crescent at Crescent Colors. And it's just, it, you know, I luckily still had the charts, but I, I mean, I just, I had the masters. But it was divided into four pieces and you could buy it, shops could buy it through through Sharon and complete each piece at a time. And so the, the deal was that each part came with the silks and the two buttons required for that part. Over the last, you know, since I kind of announced I was getting back into designing over the last year, I've had so many people ask, can, what about Christmas land? Can I get Christmas land? I've had shops ask about it. And I'm like, you know what? I'm really not raised the roof designs anymore. I, you know, I don't plan on, you know, re-releasing that or whatever. But I've just had so many ask. And then I'm doing this fundraiser for Southern Pines Animal Shelter. So I thought, you know what? I'm going to bring that back and just print it and post it and then the money from all of that will go to this animal shelter project so tomorrow saturday the what saturday the 17th of november is when it will be available on my site i had so many people after last week's video say i'm on your site and i can't find your chart it's okay it's not limited and it's not up yet it'll be up next saturday so tomorrow and you may be watching this tomorrow or maybe you're watching this and it's long past tomorrow 
It will be on my site. I'm not limiting how many I'm printing. It's going to stay up kind of ad infinitum just because I the shelter needs money on a continuing basis. Um, I have recharted it. So I, I use the old charts to make a new chart so that it's all joined together. If you are a shop owner or if you know a shop owner, they can order these charts and just have just contact me or have them contact me at xspeddler at yahoo.com and I will let them know what they need to do. The money that I make from the shops will all go to the shelter. So this is not not any, I'm just releasing it because people have asked. Now I, I have done a conversion to from, cause it's Belle Soie is what it was originally stitched in, but I have done a conversion to Classic Color Works if you'd rather use her threads and there's gonna be a button pack too that you can get. So you'll be able to get the cotton threads and the buttons on my website. The original fabric that I used, I believe was 32 count pearl barley from Lakeside Linens and it will fit on a quarter yard but i don't i'm not planning on carrying that at this time so just look tomorrow there will be a picture on the main page of my site or else in the search bar on my website just type in christmas land and it should pop up and so that's one thing that i'm doing um the zine is almost done we're nearing the last like probably 10 days or so of work right now so just like right after thanksgiving is when it should come out it's turning out super great i think those of you who have participated in some way. I still am looking for pictures, if you want, of people with um, samplers that they've stitched. I want a picture of your face with your sampler, and I have ladies that are doing that, and I so appreciate it. But if you have an idea for an article or you'd like to, you know, contribute in some way, just get in touch with me at my email address below, and maybe in a future issue you can participate. But it's, um, it's really, it's going to be so great. Okay, and then three things in my shop. Okay, uh, people went banana pancakes, crazy pants, whatever, over these next charts. Oh, here they are. I sold out immediately, immediately. I thought I got a lot, but it was not a lot. Uh, Kathy Barrick on Instagram released pictures of her new two new pieces like a week ago. And I was like, oh my gosh, those are awesome. They're gone, but they're on, the, they're on their way again. And I ordered way more this next time. So the two, her two new charts are um, Dear Santa, which is so cute. And I didn't really notice the moon's face. Oh my gosh, it's so cute. Browns and red and gold, super cute. And then the other one she released is Esther, which is this um, sheep carrying a tree on its back, which is again, super, super cute. It's kind of glary. That also sold out right away. The other thing of Kathy's that sold out immediately is Reindeer Games. And I've got more of that on the way to, not from Kathy, I'm hoping that my distributor, I ordered it this morning and I'm hoping it comes in the, in the shipment. But that's also, I love the, um, the big, it's an urn with a village in it. To me, that's just like brilliant. So uh, Kathy Barrick stuff in general right now is super hot. And the Christmas section that I put on my website is super hot. The other thing that I want to point out is if you go to my website, kittenstitcher.com, in the upper right hand corner as you look at it there's a button that's kind of red and it says needle minder of the day i have tons of needle minders that i made up for the show that i went to and i sold a bunch but i have a bunch left i don't really want to sit and spend an entire day scanning so i'm scanning one a day and if you click on that button you'll see what the needle minder is for that day and when it's gone it's gone um i think on weekends i'm going to do ones where i've got multiple or else there'll be a theme you know like cat needle minders or something like that but i've got hundreds of needle minders they're all really cool right now i'm kind of posting thanksgiving and christmas ones so just click on that button and you'll be something fun to check every day the other thing that i want to highlight the third thing is um carriage house samplings not kathy barrick but kathy barrick's sister marty marty bought carriage house samplings like six years ago, Kathy was, was going to retire from designing and then she came back, but she came back as Kathy Barrick Designs. And in the meantime, she had sold her business with her old designs to Marty. And Marty is very, very sweet. And she's been designing too. She's got some really great patterns also. And it's a similar style to Kathy's, you know, kind of primitive samplery, but with Marty's own take on it. Well, she just released two charts that I just got in the mail last night. They're going to fly out too. So this one is sheep feed sack 
Hawk Run Hollow Farm. You see that? Oh, it's so cute. And it's just a couple of colors. It's two colors, black and white. And the fabric is, what does she say? Well, it's Weeks Dye Works Havana. Really, really, really cute. And then the other one that she released is this one which is also really cute, a Christmas feed sack. What a great, great, great idea. And it's just executed perfectly. So I got a bunch of those in. I have a feeling they're gonna sell out quickly too. Christmas is so hot right now. And there's just a lot, a lot of great stuff out there. So those are the three things for my site that I wanted to highlight. Thanks to all of you who are sending things for the fundraiser. Uh, starting tomorrow, Saturday, there's gonna be a section of my website called uh, Stash for Cash for Cats and Dogs. And there'll be a link right on the front of my website. And I have people that people and businesses that have been sending me things to post. And people are being so generous. And I thank you so much. You can donate cash directly, link below. You can donate items that you've bought from Amazon, link below. So they have things like peanut butter and toys and things that they want for their enrichment center. But if you want to contribute, but also you know, get a little stash in return, people are um, sending me gently used or not used at all stash that they have in their personal stash so it could be charts fabrics threads you know whatever frames even like needlework finishing things um whatever and if it's if it's stuff that i'm like mm, this isn't really probably going to find a home on my site i will donate it to the thrift store that benefits the shelter but hoffman distributing sent some stuff this week uh, marty at carriage house sam sampling sent me a big box of donations some of the stuff that I'm receiving is stuff that I'm selling on my site in other places. But if you go to this section of my site, it'll be clearly marked. The, the, the proceeds from that sale are going to go to the uh, enrichment fundraiser. And so check that. I'm going to be adding daily because I have an unbelievable mountain of stuff right now. I probably have 45 pounds of stuff that has been donated already. That doesn't mean don't donate because the more we the more I have to put up the more money we're going to make for the shelter and if we over you know over achieve the money still is finding a very good home but our goal is 7500 right now we're at like $1,250 so we've got a ways to go and we've got until about about the end of um about the end of December-ish so thank you for that and watch for that tomorrow that's about all I've got for this week I hope you guys are having a good one and that you're staying warm and I will be posting a video again Thanksgiving weekend. I know a lot of you are going to probably be at the mall or, you know, at relatives, but I'll still post a video. And my plan is to shoot a stitch with me again this weekend. I really do enjoy doing those. And thank you to those of you who watch and say that you like hanging out with me. That's very, it makes me feel nice. All right. Well, you guys have a good weekend. Bye-bye. Wait, I have one more thing. I can never break away from you guys. Christine from Hollis Hands Creates on Etsy, I'm going to put a link below, has agreed to donate 10% of the proceeds from her sales from her Etsy shop to the shelter project. And then going forward, the donations will just be for whatever the shelter might need at that time. So I ask that you go check her out. It's a new shop, but she's got, I think, a, almost 200 items in her shop already. And um, she's very, very sweet. And it's very, very kind of her to help us out in this way, help the, the cats and dogs here in Hattiesburg. So Hollis Hands Create, Hollis Hands Create, Hollis Hands Create. And um, her shop is cute. She's got lots of cute um, Christmassy stuff in there and some buttons and things. And I think you really like her. If you don't see anything there this time that you wanna purchase, make sure to give her a like on her website. And then that way you can kind of keep up to speed with what she adds to her site as she goes along. Thank you so much, Christine. It's so very generous of you to share not only your time and talents, but um, the money, the money that you're going to send to. Thank you so much. Okay, now goodbye. <laughs>